let us start discussing about the second chapter which is LDA systems. Okay. The beauty about this particular chapter is that it's a very small chapter. Okay. The scope of having a huge concept is very less. Okay. It's a very small chapter. It is very crisp and it is very scoring. Okay. That is the beauty about this particular chapter. Majorly in this chapter, we'll be learning about the concept of convolution. Especially we'll try to deal this concept of convolution in the examination point of view. Because convolution is not a simple operator. It's a very complicated operator. The existence of a convolution from where we will get this particular concept of convolution. All those things we'll discuss in this particular chapter, LTA systems. So what is LTA? So LTI is nothing but a linear time invariant system. It's a linear time invariant system. I think we have in system properties, we have learned about what is a linear system. We have also learned about what is a time invariant system. So when you're having a combination of both of them, a linear and time invariant, then the system is what we call as a, a linear time invariant systems. First thing that can come to your mind is that why are, are we dealing with linear time invariant systems? It is because of the simple reason that a linearity is something that we generally want from a particular system and so is time invariance. So whenever we start studying, we always study from the concept which is simple. Okay. Or we take some assumptions that makes uh, studying it is going to some simple. So once we make assumptions and we try to understand, we reach to a particular level, then we will take each and every as assumption. What if this particular assumption is not correct, then we will have a theory for it. So like that, this is, this is how the study of any particular subject is going to go ahead. If you see all the systems, whether it is controls, whether it is networks or even signals in many of the subjects, whatever systems that we consider, we assume them to be linear and time invariant because we wanted simplicity. Okay. In fact, I can say that in the entire bachelor's that we're going to study, we'll be focusing on linear time invariant systems. So once we complete our bachelor and going to masters, then we will be learning about how to deal with non-linearity how to deal with time invariance, etc. Okay. So those things uh, are some things that you will be learning in masters, but as of now, and in fact, from here for the entire syllabus of signals, we will be considering or assuming that the system to be linear and time invariant because it will simplify the concepts. It will simplify the concepts and we can see if you are having an ideal system, like a linear system and a time invariant, both are ideal cases. So if you are having both of them, then how are we going to deal with that all sort of systems clear? So let us start. So the very first thing that we'll be learning in this topic, I mean, in this chapter is what we call as impulse response. Okay. So we'll be learning about impulse response. So can anyone tell me what is an impulse response? I think the name itself is saying many things for us. What is an impulse response? Very good. So whenever you are applying a, a unit, a unit impulse as an input, whenever you are applying a unit impulse as an input, the response that we got for that particular input is what we call as an impulse response. So it's a simple definition that the response of the system, the response of the system, so we call it as the response of the system when the input is an impulse, when the input is an impulse, this is what we call as an impulse response. This is what we call as impulse response. Now, so when we apply del of t to the system, the response is what we call as impulse response which we represent with h of t, which we res, uh, represent with h of t. So h of t is what we call as impulse response from now. Now, what is the advantage? Why do we study about this particular topic of impulse response? What is the advantage we are going to have if you know the impulse response? If you consider your system to be an LTA system, if you are having an LTA system, then your impulse response, so H of T 
will completely characterize your system. Will completely characterize your system. It means that how your system is going to behave can easily be told if you know the impulse response of the system. For example, from impulse response, you can say whether the system is going to be dynamic or not, whether the system is going to be stable or not, whether the system is going to be causal or not, invertible or not, all these particular things can easily be told once you know the impulse response of the system. So it will help us to completely characterize a particular system, okay, especially when it is an LDA system. If a system is non-LTA, then this H of T is not sufficient to completely characterize the system. But if the system is an LTA system, then we can completely characterize the system. This is the first very important point of having an LTA system. The second important point of having an LTA system is that finding output for any input. For example, you know H of T. Then once you know X of T, you can easily tell what is Y of T. Once you know the impulse response of the system, then you can easily compute the output of the system for any given input X of T. For any given input X of T. That is an advantage that you have once you know the impulse response of the system. Okay, It will help you to find the output for the system once the input is known. Okay, that is a very big advantage and again here we are discussing about if the system is an LTA system. Third one, we might have listened about something called as a transfer function and we might also listen about something called as a frequency response of the system, right? So H of S is what we call as a Y of S divided by X of S. So this we call it as a transfer function of the LTA system. This we call as a transfer function of an LTA system. Okay, of course, we'll be learning about frequency response. We will be learning about transfer function. But transfer function is something that many of us might have learned about, right? So the transfer function of a system. So this transfer function is basically the Laplace transform of the impulse response. This transfer function is nothing but the Laplace transform of the impulse response. So once you apply the Laplace transform here, you'll be getting the transfer function. Similarly, the Fourier transform of the impulse function is what we call as a, the frequency response of the system. Okay, so both are very, uh, very critical because we'll have a transfer function uh, from transfer function, we'll be getting the concept of zeros and poles and from the concept of poles, it will help us to understand the system better. Okay, so transfer function is something which is a very, very important concept to represent a particular system and this transfer function is something that we can get from the impulse response. Okay, so like this, there are numerous advantages of having a, the impulse response of the system. Is it clear till here? In fact, you can note it down if you want. The advantages of the LDA systems. Yes. So transfer function, transfer function, just like the way impulse response is a representation of an input. I mean, it is a representation of a system. In the same way, we also represent a system using a transfer function. Okay. In fact, we have a different ways of representing a system. One is impulse response, the other is transfer function. We can also represent a system using differential equation. We can also represent a system using a state space concept, which you will be learning in control systems. So you can have a different representations of a system. One of such very critical representation is nothing but the transfer function representation. So in the transfer function representation, that we will be learning that it is nothing but the Laplace transform of the output divided by the Laplace transform of the input. Okay, so once we learn about the concept of Laplace transform, we'll be learning about entirely about the transfer function concept. But as of now, what I'm trying to tell you is that the most important parameter transfer function is having a relation with the impulse response. 
the impulse response tra I mean, Laplace transform is nothing but the transfer function. And many of us, when studying about the concept of analog electronics, might have also listened about the frequency response of the system. Okay. So the frequency response concept of many of the electronic devices that we have is something that we generally calculate to see how a particular system responds to different frequencies. That is what we call as the frequency response. So this frequency response is also having a relation with the top of the edge of T. That is, that the Fourier transform of the impulse response is nothing but the frequency response. Yeah. The second point that we have discussed is that impulse response will help us to find the output of the system. For example, if I am applying an input called as U of T, what is the output for the system? This you can easily compute once you know the impulse response of the system. Once you know the impulse response of the system, then it will help you to find out what is the output of the system. Is the transfer function defined only in frequency domain? Yes. It is applicable only in the frequency domain. Right? right. Let me quickly tell about causal, non-causal and anti-causal. So causal system, I mean causal signal, we are talking about signals only. So causal signal is something which is equal to 0 for t less than 0. Okay. For example, if you are having a signal like this or if you are having a signal like this, you know for t less than 0, for t less than 0 the signal value is 0. Yes or no? For t less than 0 the signal value is 0. Such type of signals are what we call as the causal signals. So causal signals are those whose uh, value is equal to 0 for t less than 0. Such signals are what we call as causal signals. If the above condition is not satisfied, then we call it as a non-causal. If f of t is not equal to 0 for t less than 0. So example of this particular thing is if you are having a signal like this or if you are having a, a signal like this. So all these signals are the examples of non-causal signals. It means f of t is not equal to 0 for t less than 0, f of t is not equal to 0 for t less than 0 and then you have anti-causal signals. So what is anti-causal? Exact opposite of causal. Exact opposite of causal. So when we say f of t is equal to 0 for t less than 0, the opposite of it is nothing but f of t is equal to 0 for t greater than 0. This is what we call as an anti-causal signal. It means exact ulta. So any signal whose right side part is equal to 0 is what we call as an anti-causal signal. Yes, so y of t is equal to x of t minus 1 for t less than 0, right. So whenever you are having a signal, the question is that whether it is time invariant or not. The time invariant or time variant. The answer is it is a time variant system. It is a time variant system. Why? You can clearly see that your system output is depending on time. Don't you think that the system output is depending on time? If it is present at the instant of t less than 0. So it is something like a system has having a, I mean, is, is working like a delay circuit for t less than 0. For t greater than 0, it is working like an advancing circuit. And for t equal to 0, it is nothing, doing nothing. So if you are having such a system which is depending on time, which is depending on time, how it is going to behave? Then we call such a system as a time variant system. Okay, so this is one way of saying that directly that it's a time variant system. The other way of doing it is that you can do it in the problem, right? So first you find y of t minus t naught. So y of t minus t naught is what? 
x of t minus t naught minus 1 for t minus t naught less than 0 or I can say for t less than t naught and it is equal to x of t for t equal to t naught and it is equal to x of t minus t naught plus 1 for t greater than t naught. Right? Next, we find x1 of t. x1 of t is nothing but x of t minus tau or x of t minus t1, whatever it is. Then, if you apply x1 of tau, you will see what is the output. x1 of t, I mean. You will see what the output. The output is simply y1 of t. What is y1 of t? It is equal to x of x1 of t minus 1 for t less than 0. It is equal to x1 of t for t equal to 0. And it is equal to x1 of t plus 1 for t greater than 0. Now what is x1 of t? x1 of t is nothing but x of t minus t1. x1 of t minus 1 is nothing but x1 of t minus 1 is nothing but x of t minus t1 minus 1. x of x1 of t plus 1 is nothing but x of t minus t1 plus 1. So you might still think that y1 of t is nothing but y of t minus t0. y1 of t is nothing but y of t minus t0. But actually what is there here is that the difference is that this one. Here y of, y of t minus t0 is nothing but x of t minus t0 minus 1 for t less than t0. But here it is for t less than 0. Okay, so this is a, a derivation of explaining the how it is going to be a time varying. But if you see from a logical perspective, then you can see that clearly the system is depending on the instant. How to behave is dependent on the instant. If the instant is t less than 0, then the system behaves like a delay circuit. If the instant is t greater than 0, the system behaves like an advancing circuit. Because the system, its behavior is a function of time, so that we call it as a time, so that we call it as a, a time variant system. See what is time invariance? If the system behavior is not changing with time, right? The system behavior is not changing with time, then only we call the system as a time invariant system. Now, don't you think that this system is dependent on time? How the system has to function is it not dependent on time because depending on the instant you are selecting the system is going to behave like a delay, delay circuit or advancing circuit or as a buffer because it is dependent on time not output I'm not talking about output depending on time what I'm talking about the system behavior the system is behaving like a delay circuit when instant is t less than zero the system is behaving like a buffer for t equal to 0. The system is behaving like an advancing circuit for t greater than 0. So the behavior of the system itself is dependent on time. That's why we clearly can say it is a, a time variant system. So if you are if you are feeling you want a mathematical background for it, this is the mathematical background. You are finding out y of t minus t1, y of t minus t1, whatever be the instant. You can consider it as t0 or t1, whatever it is. Right, so th those two seem to be same, but if you see the instant, you are having a different instance here.